Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Just Work podcast, which is soon to become the Radical Respect podcast, but we'll talk about that later. I'm Kim Scott, and I'm here with... I'm Wesley Faulkner, back on the show. Yay. Yay. We missed you, Wesley. Welcome back. Uh, And Wesley and I are here with Manette Norman, and I'm going to introduce all of you listeners out there to Manette, and then we'll do the usual thing. So Manette Norman is an author, speaker, and leadership consultant who previously spent decades leading global technical teams in the software industry. Manette knows that when groups embrace diversity in all its forms, breakthroughs emerge and innovation accelerates. Her most recent position before starting her own consultancy was as Vice President of Engineering Practice at Autodesk. Responsible for influencing more than 3,500 engineers around the globe, she focused on state-of-the-art engineering practices while nurturing a collaborative and inclusive culture. Named in 2017 as one of the most influ- in- sorry, one of the most influential women in Bay Area business by the San Francisco Business Times, and as Business Role Model of the Year in the 2018 Women in IT slash Silicon Valley Awards, Manette is, rec- is a recognized leader with a unique perspective. I write, by the way, better than I read. The author of The Boldly Inclusive Leader, which I blurbed, and a co-author of the Psychological Safety Playbook, Lead More Powerfully by Being More Human, Manette is committed to helping leaders unleash the full potential of the people in their organizations. Manette holds degrees in drama and French from from Tufts University and studied at the Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris. Welcome, Manette. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here with both of you. Well, Glad we to have you. Yeah, we are thrilled, thrilled to have you. So, Manette, what we like to do is to read a page from from the book Just Work, which is getting relaunched as a paper book, paperback soon and called Radical Respect. Uh, and we would love to get your feedback on it. And Wesley, I know I can count on you to be radically candid in your feedback of uh, of this. And then, Manette, we'd love to hear a story from you, and we'll talk about it. Does that sound good? Sounds great. All right. Yeah. Here we go. Were you going to say something, Wesley? I was going to say I already have some notes. I, I, I have a lot of opinions about this piece, so I'm really, really excited. Oh, good. I'm excited because this is one of my favorite parts of the whole book. Uh, So I'm excited for your thoughts. All right, here we go. Once again, I'm going to try to read out loud, although that is not my top skill, but I'm working on getting better. All right, here we go. Shut down bloviating BS. We can all think of a typical, uh, we can all think of typical bullying behavior, finger pointing, name calling, and yelling ridiculing, threatening, and intimidating others. One particularly insidious form of bullying is what I call bloviating BS. This is what happens when one person, usually not the most informed person in the room, has unearned confidence to make things up and to take more than their fair share of airtime in a meeting. Frank Yeary, a senior finance executive at Citigroup who led his firm's early diversity and inclusion efforts, explained to me how he noticed this playing out in a way that was destructive. He remarked that though women tended to come to meetings better prepared than the men on his teams, a few of the men did most of the talking, often speaking over the women. This was not only bad for the women's careers, he explained, it was bad for decision making at the bank. The best prepared people in the room were silenced by the bloviating BSers. This kind of behavior can materially harm a team's success. Studies show that when one person does all the talking, it harms a team's performance. In studies of team effectiveness, Carnegie Mellon University professor Anita Woolley has found that Quote, as long as everyone got a chance to talk, the team did well, unquote. 
But if only one person or a small subset of the team dominated conversations, the collective intelligence declined. The airtime didn't have to be perfectly equal in every meeting, but in aggregate, it had to balance out. Project Aristotle at Google also examined an enormous body of data about team performance and found that equal participation was, more, was a more significant predictor of team success than having one superstar on the team. I am not sure why so many leaders have, exagger have an exaggerated faith that it's the superstars who determine a team's success and so give them all the oxygen in the room. Perhaps they read Ayn Rand and an impressionable age, but the data doesn't bear this misconception out. Even if you disagree with my assertion that collaboration is more important than one person's efforts, one thing is clear. When a bloviating BSer doesn't really know what they're talking about and shuts everyone else down, it's no good. It hurts the team. And it also hurts the person who talks too much, regardless of what's driving the bloviation. Maybe it's bullying, maybe it's nervous en energy, maybe it's neurodiversity. The bottom line is that others won't appreciate it. As Dan Lyons explores in his book, STFU, The Power of Keeping Your Mouth Shut. So if someone is talking too much, you do everyone a favor by sharing this feedback. All right, lay it on me. <laughs> Manette, you want to start? I will start. And I will tell you, everything in here resonated with me as something I have witnessed, I've lived through. And I agree, like there are certain words that I highlighted as you were speaking it out loud. And the word destructive, the speaking over women, the silencing of others, all of this is, I have lived and breathed this. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one part where I have a slight disagreement with the okay. and that is the opening the opening about this being a form of bullying that was where I had to I, I really had to think about that because I think of bullying as such insidious behavior that you've you some of it you've named here finger pointing name calling yelling really abusive ridiculing and the bloviating while destructive and while also having a negative impact on a team and on people in the team I don't put it in the same category as those other bullying behaviors. So maybe if there is a spectrum of bullying, it's on yeah. the lower end of the spectrum because yes. I don't think it is as damaging as, you know, traumatic, dare I use that word, as some of the more aggressive forms of bullying. However, I agree with both what Frank Yeary said, what Anita Woolley said, and the Project Aristotle study we know well that unless there is more or less equal turn taking and where everyone can participate, then you have the dominant people in the group who take mm -hmm. up all the airtime and the silent people who tend to be the women, who tend to be the neurodivergent, who tend to be maybe the people from underrepresented groups who feel they have to be perfect if they speak up, as opposed to the bloviators who feel like they can just improvise and talk off the top of their head. And those are often the dominant group people. That's what I experienced. And we were silenced as a result of it. Those of us who felt not quite in that insider group. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. Maybe, maybe it is more a form of bias than bullying. I don't know. Would that, if, like if you had to categorize it between bias, prejudice, or bullying, of I those, mean, those are not the only three things, but if you yeah, had to put it on those yeah, three I would say probably it leans more toward bias, <laughs> but with that caveat, I would say it's also this utter lack of self-awareness. Yes. Yeah. Right? Or emotional intelligence, reading the room, all of those things. Yeah. But there's probably the bias in there is that like, I have more to say than other people and maybe other people's val uh, opinions are not valid. So then maybe that's where the bias comes in. And Wesley, I think you have, you look like you want to say something too. <laughs> Oh, I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah, no, I have a laundry list. I've took some, taken some notes, and um, the the thing about the the bullying, I kind of I kind of agree with you, uh, Manette. But I see that the the bullying could come in in terms of the feeling of the other people in the room, but more uh, passive than active. Because uh, I see if there are more, pe or if there are people who actually know more more about the subject than the person who is bloviating does then it puts the person who is informed 
in a conundrum saying, do they speak up and say you're wrong? Or do they have to correct the person in public? So there tends to be some sort of silencing or self censorship that happens when someone like this is elevated to the point where it's, they, they, they speak with such confidence that it may question, make the person question their own knowledge. Like, do I need to let this person talk more so I can get to the part where he actually, or she actually makes it clear that they do understand because they must be, they're speaking with such confidence. There's obviously something I don't know because everything I've learned says the opposite of what I'm hearing. So that's, that's one thing where it, it can feel bullying if it stifles the response. Maybe it's in, it's not active, but it's something that could be the result of the action. Um, but when I was reading this, the, the phrase or the term that kind of seemed to describe this perfectly was the Dunning Kruger effect. Um, and I for know. those who don't, I don't so know the, what it is. The Dunning Kruger effect is the effect that the less that you know about a subject, the more confident you feel about it. Yes. So if you yeah. see a, a lot of, um, what do you call it? Uh, backseat drivers or mm-hmm. uh, what do they say? Sunday morning quarterback or whatever those people yeah. watch uh, football and they think, oh, why they do this? They should have done this because they don't know all the information. And yeah. so that their judgment of what the best choice is extremely clear to them because they have just this lack of data that they're pulling from. Um, and not, not only do they feel more confident, but they, they rate themselves higher on a higher confidence level than those that are extremely knowledgeable about the subject. So uh, it's almost inverse, inversely proportional to the amount of knowledge, to the amount of confidence. So that's the Dunning-Kruger effect. Um, and when someone is kind of taking up that space, um, they can speak with such confidence and such a surety that lends that the, 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 the thought or the, the misconception that no one would say they definitely know something if they didn't definitely know it. But um, especially in tech, which we all come from, you, you, it's, it's kind of the, the, the phrase, it depends, comes up a lot. And yeah. when we're thinking about how things should be done, because everything is depending uh, most things are dependent on context. Um, and uh, I once, I, just a few weeks ago, I had someone tell me that um, since I, I work in community, they said to me, I don't see what your role, what you do in community. And if your role was eliminated, no one would miss you. And oh I gosh. felt like, whoa, whoa. And I asked, like, what makes you think that? And they're like, oh, I just, I see, I saw some report somewhere or something like that. And it's just like, they're drawing on such little information yeah. that they had no idea what I was doing. And that meant that they could make that assessment. And so that's that's kind of what I heard about the Dernan Kuhn effect. And uh, a bit of also criticism or feedback uh, about the piece. Um, in the last paragraph, when you say it could be because of bullying, nervous energy, or neurodiversity, I wanted to touch on the neurodiversity part. Yes, I, w- I wanted um, to ask you about that as well. I wanted to do a clarification on definitions. Okay. So um, neurodivergent is the thought that whatever is listed in something like the DSM-5, mm-hmm. um, uh, or um, as uh, if, if you are neurodivergent, you, you would probably find yourself in that document or in that in that medical book uh and neurotypical is when you uh probably wouldn't find yourself because you're seen as uh part of the quote-unquote norm um i don't know if i uh, so neurodivergent is in the dsm-5 and right. that's not a complete list but um neurotypical is those who wouldn't find themselves there and neurodiversity is saying that the way that people present um is uh on a spectrum in which all are represented. Right. So neurodiversity means that we're, we're all part of the normal human condition because no matter how we present. And yes. so so I think you meant here uh, bullying, nervous energy, or neurodivergency or something like that as instead of yes. neurodiversity. Yes, yes, yes. Which is okay. a combination of all, it encompasses all human And it's not too late to make this change. So I'm writing that down. Thank you. 
That's yes. a good call. You can get that last minute change in before yes. you go to your paperback yes. printer, right? <laughs> yes. It hasn't gone to the printer yet. Okay. And so I've talked a lot. Uh, please, someone else speak. So, so let me let me ask you all a question. One of the reasons I think why I classified this as bullying, although I take your point, it, it might be better classified as as a form of bias, is that I read, and I'm not going to get all the details about this exactly right, but I read an article about BSing, and the article described an experiment that was done, and it listed five different. Um, top math topics, one of which was made up. It wasn't, it wasn't really a thing. And uh, it sent a survey out to a bunch of people who, and asked them to rate their expertise on, this, on these math topics. And uh, so, and the, you know, if you said you were an expert in the topic that wasn't really a thing, that was like coded as you're prone to BSing. And it turns out that uh, that men were more likely to rate themselves as expert in this topic than women. Uh, uh, white people were more likely to rate themselves as expert in this topic than people who were not white. And rich people were more likely to rate themselves in experts on this topic than people who are not, not like, you know, kind of what you would predict. And, and then the, the, the article went on to explore sort of when people felt free to BS, they also were sort of feeling that it, they didn't notice or they didn't care that they were silencing others and that there were real benefits to behaving this way, that, that w w when you presented in this confident way, you were more likely to get the promotion, you were more likely to get the job, you were more likely to get the raise than if you didn't present. So, so like, not only is it easier for some people to get away with this behavior, they also get rewarded for, and when I say they, we, like I am guilty, I am a bloviating BSer myself and I tell stories. I mean, I, when I'm aware of it, I don't do it, but some, you know, and when I'm aware of bullying, I back off. But so, so that's kind of, I wonder what you think about that article. Does that resonate for you? I've definitely, I think, yes. I mean, it definitely does. And I think that that, especially the last part about the people who do this bloviating often do get rewarded. And I've certainly yeah. seen that. I mean, you know, the biggest BSer in the room who gets the, op gets the opportunity to present to the C staff often yes. or gets that stretch assignment because they're just, they're thinking on their feet. They have so yep. much to say. They have so much to contribute, even if it is total nonsense. And then those of us in the room who may be like, I don't dare speak until I have the most perfectly formulated, you know, contribution to make. I'll stay silent until then. We don't get those same rewards. And I think I've seen that play out time and time again. So um, I think it's pretty insidious. Uh, and I think it happens all the time. And I think those demographics probably are right. Certainly what I've seen, um, because, you know, most of us, when I was in tech, when we were at the executive level, assume we all were at the same level, so uh, more or less yeah. socioeconomically. So I did see it play out in gender, mostly, mm -hmm. especially because I was in such a male dominated group. There were a few of us who were women. It was the men who did most of the bloviating, whereas there were like in this leadership team I was a part of, there were three women and what, seven or eight men. And the, all three of us yeah. as women, we would, we would hold back. We were not the bloviators. We would have such a hard time getting our our voice even heard. We would literally be raising our hands or shouting or having some man say, hey, Minette wants to say something. Like, you know, we just couldn't get a word in edgewise. So the bloviators tended to be the men. And then even within the men, there was the pecking order of hierarchy sort of. Yes. Was the ones at the higher end of the hierarchy who were closest to the executive. So it's just reinforcing the hierarchy, reinforcing the status quo, keeping down the quieter voices that may have the most important ideas to contribute and may have the most expertise on this topic, but are not being heard. So yeah, I think there's probably a lot of truth to that, Kim. Yeah, I think one of the most beautiful things I ever heard anyone say about leadership, it was comes from Johnny Ive, 
who said, the job of a leader is to give the quiet ones a voice. Yes. And I, I think that, so, so, so I think that that is, that is really true. And I also think like part of the reason why I said there may be a, a, a bunch of different reasons why one might bloviate, it's not just because one is a jerk like sometimes a nervous energy. And, and I really love the, the, the book, uh, STFU, because it's, it's written from, from the point of view of a person who, who maybe did uh, bloviate a little bit, but, but not because he was a horrible human being. He got away I, with I, it and he got rewarded for it. And then he got punished. I, I got it. <laughs> I have to say that I, I think we've all run into this personality, but I, I um, for the groups and for the companies that I see that there's a cluster of these type of people at the top, there is also a, um, a lack of innovation. New ideas get stifled. They don't get brought up. They don't get discussed. Um, and to, to reinforce what you said also before about like people do it because it works, uh, I wanted to also drop another book. Uh, yes. called what what got you here won't get you there by marshall yeah. goldsmith uh, because it works so much that people just lean on it and really want to keep doing it because it has worked thus far and then when they hit this uh, brick wall of being able to come up with ideas or having issues with their team or being able to motivate people that's when they realize that you know you, to, to go to go fast you go alone and to, to go far you go together that you need yeah. to be bringing people with you in order to do that you need to make sure that people's voices are heard and so it's it's important to make sure that uh, sometimes it's not self-awareness, but sometimes it is a, a security blanket. Like this is the thing that I'm going to fall back on because it is the thing that has gotten me through the hard times, has pulled me out of some some really rough spots. But that also, I think, is reflexive of a fixed mindset as opposed to a growth mindset. So without being yeah. able to say, I don't know something or I'm looking to get information, it makes it harder for you to take on that knowledge and to be able to actually grow, not just as a as a person who is good at their job, but as a human being. I mean, that's going into the Maslow hierarchy of needs of being able to really make sure that you're secure in yourself in order to say that this is the limit of what I know and I would like to learn more. Yeah, I think that's really, I think that is so important. I also want to double click on something you said. It works. I, it's important to note that it works for some people, but not for everyone. And, uh, and so it's much easier, I think, to be uh, to, to get away with blo bloviating BS if you're in a sort of historically dominant group than if you're not in a historically dominant group. And that is really important because there, there was, when I wrote this chapter, I sort of struggled with, at first I was like, oh, everybody should be able to bloviate. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh no, that's not the answer. Nobody actually sh should bloviate. Uh, so, so there, there are some there, and when we think about privilege, there are some privileges that everyone should have, and there's some other privileges that nobody should have. And bloviating BS is a privilege that nobody should have. I think. Okay. Yeah, I would double okay. down on that. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, Minette, you want to tell us a, a bit about your book, and if you have a story for us, we'd love to hear it. Sure. I, before I do that, I just want to I want to go back to that Johnny Ive quote because I think that is that is how I see leadership as well. And I will tell you, and, and then I'll tell you about the book and the and a story. But I will tell you that when I left my tech career and I didn't leave under the best of circumstances, the most rewarding thing that happened to me is that my staff members and my peers gave me an award, and the award was called the Voice of the Underheard. Because oh, that is beautiful. It was. It was just, it reminded me, the Johnny Ives quote made me think of that. It was like, that is, if I did nothing else in my life, that yeah. was enough, right? Yeah, that is enough, more than enough. <laughs> right. So, uh, and I wrote this book, The Boldly Inclusive Leader, as a, I would say, a culmination of everything I learned in 30 years in the tech industry and 20 mm -hmm. years of those in management and leadership roles. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty late in my career, I would say, that I really understood 
the dynamics of how we create an inclusive culture where every voice can be heard and no one is dominating, where all those wildly divergent ways of thinking and ideas can come forth. I felt like, God, I learned this in my last five years out of 30 years. And if I had been learning this 15 years ago when I started managing, how much better a leader I would have been, how much I could have helped develop leaders along the way who would understand this. And that's why I decided to write the book because you know, I've learned so much and I feel like I can help. I can really help. And it's not, it isn't rocket science, but it is self-awareness. It is changing the way we interact and run meetings and take do turn taking and things like that. And I do think it's practical. I don't think it is pie in the sky. So I wrote this book and it gives you lots of tips on you know, questions to ask yourself and behaviors that you can do every single day as a leader. And probably I will tell a story. uh, This falls more, this is not about bloviating BS as much as it is about being bullied and how I left the industry. And I will do it without violating my NDAs and all of those things, um, because I think it's important that I was, I was at the height of my career. I was at the pinnacle of my career. As you've read in my bio, I was a VP. Mm -hmm. I had a huge mandate. I was uh, in charge of transforming engineering, which is, you know, obviously a fabulous job, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I was doing that not just in terms of tools, but really in terms of culture. And for the first few years, I had one SVP I reported to who basically was my executive sponsor. Mm -hmm. Then there was a change in leadership and they brought in a new leader and they moved me down a rung. And this new leader turned out to be one of these toxic leaders and he's no longer there, but he came in. And he was going to, he was going to be the rock star that was going to, you know, and you've seen this, right? We hire the rock star. He's going to be the savior. And uh, for some reason I became the target, one of the targets, Mm -hmm. but mainly the main target there in his staff. And little by little, this is the insidious part about bullying that I just think is important to understand is you don't always notice it's happening. Yeah. It's pretty far along. Yes. And I was so doubting myself like, what are you doing wrong? Like that this was my doing that he started stripping away my responsibilities. He started literally putting his hand in my face and saying, stop, like not letting me oh speak. Gosh. Wow. And, and so I was, I was first stripped of my responsibilities and then I was literally silenced and I kept thinking I could fix it. I mean, that's the weird thing is that because I had had a very successful career and I felt like I could work with anyone, I kept thinking, this is on me, I can fix it. And it got to a point where I couldn't fix it. And I was also, you know, in a terrible state because I had lost my confidence. I had lost my mojo. I was doing, you know, I wasn't really contributing anything anymore because I couldn't. And so I left, I left the industry, I left the job and I left the company where I had spent 20 years and I left the industry. And I will say it was devastating. And I was, you know, for probably six months after I left, I didn't know what to do with myself because people thought I would just go retire, but I wasn't ready to retire. But I had to figure out what is it that I have to offer now because my confidence had been so shaken. And I realized you have those 30 years, you have 20 years of leadership, you have learned so much. And now you can hopefully stop having these toxic leaders and and really show what a new model of leadership can look like, where the leaders are the voice of the underheard and the compassionate and empathetic leaders that we all need. And so that's what led me to doing the work that I'm doing today. And um, I feel like it's the most meaningful work of my career, honestly. Well, I'm so sorry that happened to you and hats off to you for responding to it in such a productive, productive way. And you know, writing a book like the one you wrote, that's a labor of love. So thank you for doing it. And and I know it's going to help a lot of people. Like the practical, tactical tips in it are really um, invaluable. Well, thank you. And, you know, I think it's, it's interesting. You've done this obviously multiple times now. Launching a book into the world is so interesting because there's the initial launch. My book launched in August and there's all that excitement, all those pre-orders that happened. And now it's just sort of, I would say slowly because it's not like a bestseller, bestseller, but it's slowly finding its audience. And I think it's finding the audience it needs to find. And I'm encouraged because I already have some bookings for next year for talks and workshops based on the, the book. And I think that it's just going to excel. So I'm excited about it. That is great. I have a, I have a question about the book because I, I, I see some parallels between yours and Kim's life. And just yes. one curious question is that apparently um, the person, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't read the book, but the person that you you had that 
uh, issue with, you reference them in the book, even though it's not violating NDAs. Do you have you heard back from that person, or does that person know that they are in this book in that way? Well, they're not. They're not in any way mentioned. And no, I have not heard uh, from that person. That person and I have had no contact um, mm, since I left, and he left. He left very soon after I left. We've had no yeah. contact. It's so hard. These these leaders. Uh, I once worked for a boss who bullied me and belittled me. And it's funny how, how that, I mean, one of the things that I admire in your ability to tell the story is your willingness to share how much it hurts, you know, because mm-hmm. you like to pretend like, oh, it can't bother me. But I literally shrank half an inch <laughs> in the I course heard of that. That. in your yeah. other podcast on bullying. I heard that you say yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. And I, I only worked for this guy for like a year. My boss was like, oh my gosh. I mean, my uh, my doctor was like, do you really need this job? You know, like, this is not good. <laughs> you're shrinking and you're only five feet tall. You don't have, you know, you shouldn't shrink anymore. And, I, you know, it is really traumatizing. It can really knock you off your game to, to especially, a bo- I mean, any form of bullying can knock you off your game. Like, it wakes you up at three in the morning. Yeah. It, and then people, when, when you're going through it, another, uh, another time in my career where I was experiencing some bullying, people were like, well, don't use this as an excuse not to do your best work. And I'm like, how could I do my best work in these circumstances, you know? No, you know, and to your point about it being traumatizing, it really isn't. I've met, so the thing is, of course, what I know is that my story is just one of hundreds and thousands of stories like it and worse. I mean, people have been through way worse than I've been through. I think having gone through it, I've now connected with a lot of people or they've connected with me who have been through other situations like this. And the, I guess the thing that's so sad is how common it is in the workplace for people to experience this. And uh, one of the statistics that I found very discouraging that I would like to see reversed, this comes from the Workplace Bullying Institute, is mm-hmm. that in most cases where bullying is reported, It's the victim of the bullying who leaves the organization and more commonly the bully stays. Yes. And in my case, I left, but then the bully left after me. But in many cases, Mm -hmm. the bully's still there getting rewarded, moving up the corporate ladder, you know, whatever it is. And that is, that's the thing that I'm desperately hoping to see change, at least in terms of those, those horrible statistics. Cause it's quite damning really to see that. Yeah. Yeah. And Wesley, you have a lot of stories about getting, I mean, that's how you and I met. Actually, you were in a situation where you were getting bullied at work and and you read Just Work and reached out. That's how that is. And that will happen, Minette, you'll see. And you'll meet so many wonderful people. Um, so what what do you what do you recommend to folks out there who might be getting bullied how like you i think you both of you have responded with enormously productively to this difficult situation but what what advice would you give wesley i was just saying it's just i i've had this conversation with several people who've had really traumatizing events and it's almost like when you have parents who are divorced you either really believe in the institution of marriage or you'll say you're never going to get married again. I think you can go one of two ways. And um, I think we also need to realize that hurt people hurt people. And sometimes the people who uh, are one of these toxic leaders had a toxic leader and uh, you saw them maybe get successful or or just say, I'm I'm done with being nice because it seems to not be working. Or those who say that, you know, that, that the status quo doesn't need to be status quo. It doesn't need to be the way that we live and the way that we have to work. So I'm going to be uh, a light for good rather than um, uh, working for the darkness. And so I really admire uh, Manette, your, your, your book and uh, how you're able to just be able to rebound in the place that you can actually have people see and relate to your experience. So they feel less alone. And I think that's kind of where we are with this podcast. And my journey was one that you uh, kind of described as where I had to work on detoxifying by removing that voice, that self-doubt of just being able to remove that, that thought that it's me and I'm the problem and really focus on how um, 
the system itself failed me rather than just focusing on the individual in order to feel like I can make a difference. And so um, thank you for attacking the system and trying to find a way to kind of make things better for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the only advice I give to anyone who is you, who is a victim of bullying is that stand up to the bully or report it and get out. If you, if you, you know, if nothing's going to change in the organization, then you need to take care of yourself. And obviously we all have different privilege and can we move, can we change jobs? Um, but you do need to take care of yourself because it can be just so devastating. And so I also am very grateful. I've always had an amazing network of people who support me and it's my friends and my family and my colleagues. And you need someone to talk to when you're going through stuff like this, whether it's a therapist or a friend or whatever, but don't, don't do it alone because it is just devastating. Yeah, it really is. I think, I think two things you said there. One is locate the exit nearest you, which is really important if you possibly can. And two, build solidarity, uh, because that, I think, is what is the most effective way to to demonstrate to someone who indulges in bullying that they're not going to get away with it. I mean, the reason why bullies continue to bully is that they continue to get a- away with it, and not only sometimes to get away with it, but to be re- rewarded. I mean, I think there comes a moment on so many teams' history when the bully gets promoted, <laughs> and that's the moment when the culture begins to lose. Yes, yes. Absolutely, yeah. It, it sucks when people win by doing the wrong thing. Yes, uh, it does. And, and, but I think we, we all suffer the consequences from one person's success in that environment. And hopefully leaders will learn that that is not the path for mutual success. Yes. Um, But only if we all stand up to it. So on that note, I want to encourage everyone listening to, if you're having a story, if you're struggling with a, with a bully at work, feel free to write in. Uh, We want to help foster solidarity in the broader world against this. Uh, buy Manette's book. It is great. Uh, it will offer all kinds of advice. And uh, Manette and Wesley, great as always to chat with both of you. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. It was great to talk to both of you. And if folks yes. want to reach out to us, they can send us a note at hello at justworktogether.com. Just Wesley, were you going to say something else? I was going to say, yeah, hello at justworktogether.com. All right. Thanks, everyone. Take care.